know heaven, I know the true self, presence, whatever we want to call this, can seem really far away. And that's only from the perspective of the person who feels separate. So the veil is the me energy. It's the seeker energy. So when this energy of, oh my gosh, I'm here, but I'm separate, arises, that's when the veil appears. It's the same energy. The veil and the seeker are one. The veil and something's missing is one. So when we feel like something's missing, that this is not it, that this isn't God, that this isn't heaven, we veil it, and then we go on the wild goose chase. to have a mind or to feel like a me, okay? It's just like a shell for a little bit, if you will. That pops out, it pops, it breaks. But not by your personal will. That's what we're sold and taught on the spiritual path. You're gonna work really, really, really hard, man. And you're gonna become enlightened. No, this is all enlightenment. All of this is awakening. All of this is presence. This is freedom. Freedom is not a concept of being a certain way, or an idea or an imagination. Freedom really can't be known, because everything we list under freedom is just gonna be based on our conditioning. You know what I mean? Freedom is unknown. God is really unknowing. This is about unknowing. I don't know is how we get out of the game, if you will. Seemingly. Knowing takes a shape. I know we take shape, we're concrete, Unknowing. Vapor. Emptiness.
I know I'm doing really bad right now. Right? That one who knows and who's tracking, that's, that's the energy of something's missing. Awakening's the end of tracking and measuring and knowing where you're going, if it's good or not, if everything's okay. It's the end of knowing. That addictive knowing of like, I have to know I'm safe. I have to know I am okay. I have to know that I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. That's the, the knowing I'm speaking of. Of course you know where you parked your car. Of course you know where your grocery store is. That's an organic mind. That's a natural mind. That's not the egoic, personal identity mind. The personal identity mind, it's, it's just completely restless. Completely restless. It has no idea what to do with itself at all. At all. And then it looks to others of how should I be? And it finds communities and it finds groups of certain behaviors or, or certain intentions or, or whatever it is, right? And there's, there's no good or bad here, but that's, it just shows that uh, uh, we don't know how to be organic. We don't know how to be organic. You know, I used to think, I gotta be this way. I gotta speak this way or talk this way, or I should be more still or more silent or whatever, because we read books and, and we see these things. But that's, that's uh, confining life, man. That's, that's confining life force to say an enlightened being walks and talks and looks like this. It's a trap, man. It's a trap. You're meant to be however you're being in this now. naive and it can seem like oh just just trust that yeah leave behind the concepts leave behind the rules and trust your heart trust presence it's, it's, it's the same thing trust life it's you but you don't decide how you're gonna be and that's the, the issue with the ego or the separate sense of me is I'm gonna decide how I'm gonna be. <laughs> How's that going, man? How's that going? His, his life just wants to express as you, if you will. Like, why else are you in existence? Why else is this instrument in existence? A mistake? Get out of here. Get out of here. No mistakes. You're not a mistake. None of this is a mistake. Magic. Magic.
was the first thing that you did after you you became enlightened i laughed a real uproarious laughed seeing the whole absurdity of trying to be enlightened the whole thing is ridiculous because we are born enlightened and to try for something that is already the case is the most absurd if you already have it you cannot achieve it only those things can be achieved which you don't have which are not intrinsic part to your being but enlightenment is your very nature and i had struggled for it for many lives it has been the only target for many many lives and i had done everything that is possible to do to attain it and i had always failed it was bound to be so because it cannot be an attainment for money for power for prestige and then one day when it gets fed up with all these extrovert activities it becomes ambitious for enlightenment for liberation for nirvana for god but the same ambition has come back only the object has changed first the object was outside now the object is inside but your attitude your approach has not changed you are the same person in the same rut in the same routine the day i begin and die to simply means the day i realize that there is nothing to achieve there is nowhere to go there is nothing to be done we are already divine and we are already perfect as we are no improvement is needed no improvement at all god 
never creates anybody imperfect. is true. That there is nothing more beautiful, more blissful than enlightenment. Even the talk of it Even the far away echo Even the shadow of it It is certainly difficult to say anything about it. Although my whole life I have been saying things about it and only about it. Even if though I am talking about other things, I am only talking to lead you. towards an understanding of enlightenment. It is your state of silence. It is your state of universal It is you, without the ego and its problems. It is you, without any questions and without any answer either. Simply silent. There is no joy which can transcend this silence. It is pure light. It is pure delight.
I can understand your question. Just to hear about it again and again. is a necessary need so you don't forget why you are here. of all my stupid, ridiculous efforts to attain it. I laughed at that day on myself and I laughed on that day on the whole of humanity because everybody is trying to achieve. Everybody is trying to reach. Everybody is trying to improve. You see that, you see? And you say, I realize I'm always doing that. Now tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. Shall I put it like that? We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> See, because sometimes doing good to others and even doing good to oneself is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. So we don't know.
we find this problem, you see, repeatedly throughout the entire history of human spirituality. In the phraseology of Zen Buddhism, you cannot get this by thinking. You cannot attain to it by not thinking. It is only, you see, as you, as getting out of your own way ceases to be a matter of choice. When you see that there's nothing else for you to do. When you see, in other words, that doing something about your situation is not going to help you. When you see equally that trying not to do anything about it is not going to help you. Where are you? Where do you stand? You're nonplussed. And you are simply reduced to watch it. Here's the situation, you see. There is no, the, the, the whole idea of self-improvement is a, uh, is a will of the wisp and a hoax. That's not what it's about. Let's begin where we are. What happens if you know, if you know beyond any shadow of doubt that there is nothing you can do to be better? Well, it's kind of a relief, isn't it? Now, you say, well, now what will I do? See, there's a little fidget that comes up. Because we're so used to um, <laughs> if, making things better. Leave the world a better place than when you found it, sort of thing. I want to be of service to other people and all these dreadfully hazy ideas. And uh, so, we think there's that little itch still, but supposing instead of that, seeing that there isn't really anything we can do to improve ourselves or to improve the world, if we realize that that is so, it gives us a breather in the course of which we may simply watch what is going on, watch what happens. Nobody ever does this, you know. Therefore, it sounds terribly simple. It sounds so simple that it almost looks as if it isn't worth doing. But you ever just watched? Watch what's happening. And watch what you are doing by way of reaction to it. Just watch it happen. And don't be in a hurry to think you know what it is. In other words, people look at the, say, oh, that's the external world. Oh, how do you know? Child, 
Now, you see, if you do that, you do at least give yourself a chance. And it may be that when you are in this way freed from busybodiness and being out to improve everything, that your own nature will begin to take care of itself. Because you're not getting in the way of yourself all the time. You will begin to find out that the great things that you do are really happenings. You, as you are now, are the Buddha. That's unbelievable. Because we are always trying to get away from ourselves as we are now, in one fashion or another. And it's only, we, the, we will only stop doing that through a series of experiments in which we try resolutely to get away from ourselves as we are. So long as you are trying to make progress, you will go up. But up always implies down. So while you are trying to get better and better and better, that means that when you get to the best, you can only go on to the worst. And so you go round and round and round, ever chasing the illusion that there is something outside yourself, outside your here and now, to be attained that will make things better. And the thing is to recover from that illusion. So a Buddha means somebody who has woken up and discovered that running around this thing may be fun and it may be good to run around, but if you think you're going to get something out of it, you're under illusion. Because you're forever the donkey with a carrot suspended from his own halter.
So you and I got born, but then you and I went into training and we went into basically somebody training. See, we went into training about how to be somebody. Now, you were trained by the best kind of people because they all thought they were somebody. Your mother and father both thought they were real. And therefore they thought their child was real. So you are surrounded by a consciousness in which your separateness is what's real. And you go into separate training, somebody. And you learn how to be somebody and get what you think you need. The somebodyness is like computer software for functioning on this plane. It's our thinking minds. Once we are somebody, meaning we have a conceptual map of reality that includes who we think we are and who we think everybody else is. So we know a tree is a tree and a rose is a rose. Then we go into somebody's special training. See, didn't you? Didn't you? Then we get trained how to be somebody special. I was. I was very special. Everybody was special. And then for us, certainly us who are gathered in this room, something happened. It may have been lurking all through your life or it may have just happened, but at one moment or at some point you awakened. And you can put those in many terms. You realize you'd been had. You realize you had been trapped in somebody-ness. Just in the same way as Gurdjieff talks about landing in prison. And he said, if you would escape from prison, the first thing you must realize is you're in prison. If you think you're free, no escape is possible. That's what happened in 1961 with the mushrooms. And from then on, the game changes. Because at that point, your awareness has experience from other, what are now called non-ordinary states of consciousness. You have experienced reality from those planes, and you have known experientially that it's equally as valid as the plane you thought was real. When I first awakened, the feelings I had were, I'm home. This is so familiar. Where have I been all this time? How have I cut myself off from this thing? I've been starving to death, and here I was in an ocean of plenty. How bizarre.
then slowly everything would wear off and I'd be back in it. But I'd have the memory of that. And that memory kept compelling me forward to try to get into that state and stabilize it. So Maharaji showed me that that was possible. And what I have done since that time, which is the last 23 years, is to do the practices and live my life in such a way as to optimize my stabilizing myself in an awakened state. Because as far as I can understand, that is the most compassionate thing that I can do. Now that has nothing to do with whether I'm active or not. It's how I'm active. It's how I'm active. Because what I have seen to my own horror is a lot of my best intentions as an ego to relieve the suffering of others has ended up increasing the sum total of suffering in the world. Because as you see the web of interconnected information and consciousness, you see that as each individual in the system changes, the whole system changes. So I saw that I had to work on myself as a way of extricating my awareness from the exclusive identification with my ego structures, with my map of reality with my identification with my desires with my needs with my wants not stopping any of that or trying to stop it or denying its existence it's this is not mashugana stuff this is the ability to extricate yourself from exclusive identity with those things you don't push them away because then you just end up a horny celibate you can't do that. It's the awakening of something within you that is deeper than thought. That's really the main thing. And that's already there, you just didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I know this? <laughs> it's a deep-seated habit of uh, being totally identified with thinking. It's the human condition, which could be described as lost in thought. Because up to now, evolution has been unconscious, it was automatic. But now evolution is consciously chosen by a species, and that's a revolutionary thing. And you are part of that. So I 
can still make movies, I can still have a girlfriend. Oh, yes. Even if I'm <laughs> yes, you, it's beautiful. You, you, it's beautiful. It's a playground. You play around with the world. You can you, you take action. You relate, but you're not lost in it. Most humans are lost in it. Physical pain or emotional pain of losing someone? Most of the human pain is psychologically created. There's an enormous amount of psychological pain, suffering, I call that. When suffering goes, and there's a possibility for humans now to live without suffering, that is the possibility. There may still be some physical pain. It may be that you get toothaches or bodily pains from time to time. Suffering is another level that lies on top of the pain. Suffering implies a story, a little me that is unhappy, a mentally constructed entity, a little me that has an unhappy story that is its identity. <laughs> and that creates an enormous amount of suffering. Not only do you make yourself suffer, you make people around you suffer. To be at one with life is to be at one with the present moment because that's the only place where life can be found. You cannot leave the space of now that stays with you, whatever you do and wherever you go. Your life has never been not now <laughs> and will never be not now. Are you making the present moment into an enemy in some way, internally, <laughs> through thinking about some, something that's, just, that's nothing, nothing to do with now? I need to figure something out. Well, first of all, be here fully, and then whatever is needed in your life comes. It comes out of the power that dwells in the present moment that most people overlook. There's an enormous power here, which is the power of life itself. And most people look for something to draw this.
how of life itself is inseparable from who you are in the depth of your being. Many times you will forget. But the moment you realize that you forgot, there's a possibility of saying, ah, yes, I lost the present moment. And there's a possibility of choosing to re-enter the present moment. The first thing that happens when you re-enter the present moment, you become more aware of sense perceptions. You suddenly, there's a greater alertness. And then you become more aware of the aliveness in your body. You feel the life within. Oh. It's like the entire vibrational frequency of your body shifts when you become present. It's a different state of consciousness. Oh. More alert more life and many times you will lose it and then you'll remember that's good enough I was even too smart, right? And then you may not have a, a, a gush over the intelligence here, but it was too much intelligence over here because it was trying to figure this out. It was trying to understand this. Okay, trying to understand this. This is it. Let me see, let me go over that again slowly. This is it. Now those are really simple words and that's a really simple sentence. Where is all the confusion? See, but what you think is that there is, that this is it for me. This is, this is it that I am experiencing. But if this is it, what else could actually come to understand that this is it? When this is it, there's no other to come to understand that. There's, there's, there's no me that's going to finally get the big non-dual shift. Hell, I don't know how you're going to shift to non-duality. This is non-duality.
There's only non-duality, hence the term non-duality. Non-duality, meaning not two, or not more than, you know, not two. And I use the word oneness because it's a convenient term. It's not really accurate because that indicates that there's one something. I can't find the one something. I notice that there is one nothing. And I notice that I am that nothingness. Which doesn't mean that there's not, uh, I can't tell you that I'm not alive. I can't tell you that I'm not alert. I can't tell you that I'm not aware. And I can't tell you that I'm not awake. But when I tell you that, it's not a Fred Davis talking. It really isn't. It's oneness describing itself.